Hello, I'm Reverend Scott Whipperman, pastor here at First Presbyterian Church in Helena, Montana, and we welcome you to our worship service today. I'd like you to know that regardless of who you are or where you are in your journey of faith, you're welcome here at First Presbyterian Church. Our New Testament reading comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 21, starting with verse 5. Some of his disciples were remarking about how the temple was adorned with beautiful stones and with gifts dedicated to God. But Jesus said, As for what you see here, the time will come when not one stone will be left on another. Every one of them will be thrown down. Teacher, they asked, when will these things happen? What will be the signs that they are about to take place? And he replied, watch out that you are not deceived, for many will come in my name claiming I am he and the time is near. Do not follow them. When you hear of wars and of uprisings, do not be frightened. These things must happen first, but the end will not come right away. Then he said to them, Nations will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There will be great earthquakes, famines, and pestilence. These things must happen first, but the end will not come right away. Nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. I've already read that part, haven't I? <sighs> Let's start at 12, verse 12 here. <sighs> But before all this, they will seize you and persecute you. They will hand you over to synagogues and put you in prison, and you will be brought before kings and governors, and on all on account of my name. And so you will bear testimony to me. But make up your mind not to worry beforehand how you will defend yourselves. For I will give you words and wisdom that none of your adversaries will be able to resist or contradict. You will be trade even by parents, brothers and sisters, relatives and friends, and they will put some of you to death. Everyone will hate you because of me. But not a hair of your head will perish. Stand firm and you will win life. The word of the Lord. Well, things aren't exactly peachy in Jesus' time. You know, there's this minor thing called a Roman occupation that's taking place. You not only have to pay taxes to Rome, you still have to pay taxes to Israel, and all kinds of other bad stuff is going on. And the disciples are in Jerusalem after being up in Galilee for a while, and they're admiring this temple, this temple which has stood for about 550 years since it was rebuilt after the exiles returned from Babylon. And they're admiring its strength and its beauty. And then Jesus says, yeah, but not in too long, one stone of this temple will not still be standing on another. And so immediately... The disciples want to know when this is going to happen. What are the signs going to be that this is about ready to take place? And as Jesus does so often, he answers them. But it's not entirely clear that he's answering them to the questions they asked. Because Jesus says that an end will be coming, but it's a very cataclysmic ending. It's not merely the destruction of the temple. He's talking about pestilence. He's talking about all kinds of things, signs from heaven, great earthquakes. Now, clearly those that were in Jerusalem in 70 A.D., when Israel rebelled against Rome and Rome laid siege to Jerusalem and came down and tore down the temple, things must have seemed like the end. Of course, the end that Jesus is talking about could have also been Good Friday, could it not? Or maybe it's something yet to come. And he gives some bad news to the disciples, right? He tells them to watch out. There will be deceivers among you. They will try to tell you things that are not true. There will be wars between nations. 
There will be this pestilence. There'll be destruction. There'll be great earthquakes. There'll be signs. But don't worry. Orson Scott Card wrote a book, a, a political sci-fi book called Empire. And in Empire, it's set in the United States, and a civil war breaks out. Not between two geographically separate places, but between two different ideologies. There's a group armed with some scary technology that takes over New York City and declares itself the real government of the United States, that this other government has become a false government, and there's a standoff now between these two. The good news is this civil war is resolved relatively quickly in a matter of weeks with minor bloodshed compared to our past civil war. And everyone comes back together. At the end of the story, Mr. Card puts in some afterwords. It's not part of the story. He's just talking about what he sees in the world and how divided our nation is, part of what led to his writing this novel. He says that we have become so divided that should you believe in Proposition X, whatever that may be, something like global warming, or maybe that we should reduce taxes on the businesses and the wealthy, if you believe in one of those things, it is assumed that you believe in all things that belong to the camp that holds that position. And you're vilified by those in the other camp for holding such ideas. But even stranger is if you believe in X that one camp holds, but you don't believe in all the other things or some of the other things that this camp believes in, you'll be vilified from within the camp, from the side that you're apparently on. They'll think that you're a traitor for not holding all of the beliefs that they hold. He goes on to mention that he says, it goes deeper than this, however. A good working definition of fanaticism is that you are so convinced of your views and policies that you're sure that anyone who opposes them must either be stupid and deceived or have an ulterior motive. We are today a nation where almost everyone in the public eye displays fanaticism with every utterance. Kind of sound familiar? He goes on and talks about how that we are secretly often afraid that maybe our beliefs, our opinions aren't the right ones. And the more secretly we're afraid of that, then the less tolerant we are of any voice that might offer an opposing opinion. And we go to great lengths to try to suppress those other voices. He goes on to say, we live in a time where moderates are treated worse than extremists, being punished as if they were more fanatical than the, the actual fanatics. We live in a time when lies are preferred to truth and truths are called lies, when opponents are assumed to have the worst conceivable moments and treated accordingly. And when we reach immediately for coercion without even bothering to find out what those who do disagree with us are actually saying. In short, we are creating for ourselves a new dark age, the darkness of blinders we voluntarily wear, which, if we do not take them off and see each other as human beings with legitimate, virtuous concerns, will lead us to tragedies whose cost we will bear for generations. Or maybe we can just calm down and stop thinking that our own ideas are so precious that we must never give an inch to accommodate the heartfelt beliefs of others. How can we accomplish that? By scorning the voice of extremism from the camp we are aligned with. We must moderate ourselves instead of insisting on moderating the other guy while keeping our own fanaticisms alive. Pretty good description of what's happened here recently. Except 
Mr. Card wrote this in 2005 and 2006, 10 or 11 years ago. And I'm sure that if we were to ask him today, he would say that from the time when he wrote this, things have gone even further in the wrong direction. The things are worse off now than they were back then. And now, in this time, is our opportunity. Now is our opportunity to heal this divide as Christ would heal divide, as Christ did heal divides. Not a healing by one ideology taking over another ideology, as if there were just two ideologies, right? <laughs> no, this is our opportunity to demonstrate that we are Christians and that we live and act as Christ lived and act. What does Christ end the Luke reading with today? It's more upbeat than the beginning part of the reading, right? And so you will bear testimony to me, but make up your mind not to worry beforehand how you will defend yourselves, for I will give you words and wisdom that none of your adversaries will be able to resist or contradict. Not on a hair on your head will perish. Stand firm, and you will win life. As Christians, now is our opportunity. Now is our opportunity to bear testimony to Christ, not to worry about how to defend ourselves against those who throw slings and arrows against us, not to worry how to defend ourselves against the ones in our own camp that call us a traitor for not signing up for everything that they believe. Christ will give us words and wisdom that no adversary can resist or contradict. So, Christ tells us to go out there and show that we are Christians by how we act, by how we love. And not a hair on our head will perish. And we stand firm and we will win life. This is not giving in. This is not rolling over. This is not abandoning our beliefs. This is standing firm with two feet in the Bible as, and believing in Christ in what Christ tells us to do. This is a time where we come together and honor all, particularly those that we may disagree with. Sometimes we have adversaries. In the 1960s, Congress was looking at cutting PBS's $20 million budget, wiping it out. $20 million back then is about like $160 million today, significant budget. And so there was hearings in Congress, and PBS was bringing people forward to testify about the travesty this would be to cut the funding for public television. And they brought forward a number of people to talk. And near the end, if not the last one, they brought forward the powerful Mr. Rogers. <sighs> Mr. Rogers, as you may know, is a Presbyterian pastor. And as a Presbyterian pastor, when you finish all what you need to do education-wise and all the ecclesiastical things that you need to accomplish, you're not ordained until you're ordained to a ministry. So, like most of us, we're not ordained until we have a calling to a church as a pastor, associate pastor, or something like that. Mr. Rogers was different. He was ordained to his TV show, Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. He was ordained to this ministry to children. And here he is coming before Congress, and they're threatening to cut the budget. They're threatening to cut his ministry to children, the very ministry that he was ordained to. And what does Mr. Rogers do? 
Well, he speaks to the chair of the committee that's overlooking this budget, a very powerful senator who had never seen Mr. Rogers' neighborhood, by the way. And he explains to him what the show is. He talks to him about how he's talking to children and what he's trying to accomplish with children. He speaks like, well, Mr. Rogers. Because he's not an act on his show. That is who he is, the way he talks. That is his being. And here, in the presence of the enemy, he's talking the same way, respecting the person that he's talking to. And he goes on to share the lyrics of a song he wrote. Mr. Rogers wrote lots of songs for his show, and he shared the lyrics with this one song with the man. And when it was done, the senator looked at him and said, I have goosebumps. I guess you have your $20 million. He preached him, not as an enemy, but as a friend, and shared with him what he knew, what he did. And the outcome was amazing. The, I guess you'll have her $20 million, didn't come with any of the previous speakers that went before and spoke. So this is our opportunity. Our opportunity to come talk with others like they are maybe people. I've had dinner with those that I don't particularly like before. And, and lo and behold, I came to discover that they were actually human. <sighs> Jesus did this all the time, of having meals with people that were different from him or different from each other. This was a favorite tool of Jesus for destroying walls, tearing things down. This is something that we can learn from and use. Because as Christians... We can listen to others with love. We can listen to them with the idea that there might be something worthy of what they're going to say. We can actually hear out their ideas even if they differ from ours. We can listen. In Isaiah, the wolf and the lamb lay down together. They don't become one or the other. One doesn't eat the other. They lay down together. There's a wolf and a lamb. They're two different people or two different animals. And we are all different people. We all come from different contexts. We all have different understandings. We are brought up different ways. We have different views. It's not that there's going to be one magic view that's going to take over all of us. But we can deal like Christians with one another in our differing views. And we can see these views as not as some opposition, but as an opportunity, as a gift. Because it's because of our different perspectives that we aren't all like lemmings running over the cliff together. Everyone brings something valuable with their perspective, with their understanding that helps paint a better picture of our reality for all of us and improves our understanding of this. <clears throat> So we can seek the wisdom and the truth in this other with a different idea. We can treat them well with respect and honor as another of God's creations, just like we are one of God's creations, that they have value just as we have value. The theologian and author Gordon Lathrop quoted Duane Priebe, a Lutheran seminary president, of saying that whenever we draw a line that includes us and separates others, Jesus is always on the other side of that line. Jesus spent his ministry tearing down walls. If we want to be standing with Jesus, it's probably pretty good if we don't go around drawing lines in the sand and building walls. So we have an opportunity as Christians, as in the way of Christ, to heal the divide that is tearing apart our nation and our country. And 
we can change the world right here from Montana, Helena, or Helena, Montana. Friday evening, after we served the Special Olympians, the athletes who were here competing, we cleaned up a little bit, and then a group of us ran off to see a movie called The Arrival, or called just The Arrival. It's a wonderful movie. It's about brand new, the first weekend it's out. If you go to see this, be ready to think, and be ready not to hold what you think you know in too high a regard as you watch the movie. But if you've seen the previews for the movie, the arrival is that 12 spaceships, alien ships, have arrived on Earth. And they're all hovering above the Earth, not sitting on it. They're kind of egg-shaped spacecraft. And Luis Baker, a linguistics professor, is called out to try to communicate with the beings in these things, to understand what it is that they want. That's all in trailers. So I haven't given away anything yet. <laughs> and there is a message that they want to give out. And Luis Baker gets it out to the world. But guess what? Of those 12 spaceships that are scattered around the earth, the only one in the United States is in a mountain valley right here in Montana. And Luis comes here to Montana and talks with the aliens. And here from Montana spreads the message and it goes around the world. So we too have the opportunity to go out and spread this message of Christ's inclusiveness, of Christ's love and redemption, of Christ's love for all of us. We have the opportunity to go out and spread this and we can infect the state the nation, and the world with Christ's disease of love. So, as Christ said, by this everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. <laughs> 